we're watching it that night and we're watching the um, Google Analytics on the website and I was like, oh, look, there's 100 people online. We've never had more than 30. And I was like, oh, there's 1,000, 10,000, 60,000. Wow. Oh, my God, I hope they don't try and buy. <laughs> and I'm like, so we're going to the chef. So how much food have we got? Is it the 800 boxes we're going to have to stop selling soon? And he's like, oh, I thought you were full of shit. We're, like, that's what he said. And he goes, I only made 200. Oh. We sold 2,500 and no one knew how to turn off the website. Yeah. And oh. the website crashed every two to four minutes. No one's ever lucky. I, mean, I think the only lucky you get in life is where you're born and then you make the rest. Stick around. It's going to be a good ride. A bit flustered, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> a bit flustered. <laughs> Well, like I said, boys, I was digging a hole in my front yard. What was the hole for? Of doing a retaining wall that I was supposed to get done by the weekend. Still doing retaining walls at this extra. point? I thought we were talking about caulking last time. Yeah, this is extra. Extra. Okay. Then I've got pavers over here. They're doing some work. I've got the fire guy just rocked up to do some stuff to my fireplace. And my calendar dings at me. I'm like, why is my calendar dinging at me? <laughs> <laughs> this is not what we're supposed to be. I look at it, it goes, it's supposed to be Melbourne right now. And I live an hour and a half away, so my morning's been very chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> you here, though? Off the car. you done well. I reckon you did well. I reckon you did a good time. Didn't speed. Kept the speed limit, so. Good man. Yeah. Did you research good. on the drive? I've got one did a lot of research. One more question about the hole, dude. Yeah. Down there, down the peninsula, how... How does that work with the sand? How, how deep are you going? Easy how digging. wide? Easy digging. Is it easy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. 1,200 deep. It didn't 1,200? Yeah. So I just need stairs say, to get John there. Yeah. John, I'll need you to finish off another oh, 600 here. I had to race upstairs, shower up. <laughs> had to ring the in-laws, keep pick the dogs up. There's a lot of action at the house. I've got to go, I've got to, go to Melbourne. <laughs> well, normally Danny's at, you know, at home, but she's not there today, so. Is she normally letting you know? Anyway, Dan, you better get yeah. I've got your clothes on the bed, mate. You're ready to go. Oh, it's just a, <laughs> It was just an extra thing. I had to worry about the dogs. Yeah. We don't have to. Mm. Love it. There you go. We're here. Oh, you're here now, mate. You're happy, yeah. happy to do a podcast now, Hollywood? Yeah, all excited about today. Very, very Me excited too. today. Too. Very excited today. Welcome back, guys. Australia's number one podcast. Yeah. We are the little fish and we speak to the big fish about town each and every week. We talk property, mindset, development, business, life, bringing you guys as much value as possible. Thanks, guys, for listening or viewing, however you're consuming us. Please like, share, subscribe interact get the algorithm pumping guys let's go let's get straight into it guys today's guest a practicing dietitian an accredited exercise psychologist physiologist, physiologist <laughs> Come on, a Pete. diabetes <laughs> oh, i can't say that word did you say scientologist oh man i've actually got it with an f <laughs> so i just see the ph i'm dyslexic <laughs> diabetes at diabetes educator and award-winning entrepreneur she's an amazing businesswoman having co-founded be fit food australia's leading dietitian and doctor designed meal provider put simply she's a queen of weight loss and health 2018 Business Award winner, having successfully pitched BeFit Food on Shark Tank 2020. Good show. Benny's favourite show. Good show. Gaining investment from Australian business royalty Janine Ellis. Boost juice, boys. She's no joke. Nah, she's the real deal. Since that show, her business went from five to 65 staff in four weeks, growing 1,500% wow. in that time. <laughs> That's incredible. They wouldn't need, it's they, always scary. Well, how, how do you do that? They all need well, name tags or something. We're going to find out, aren't we? Yeah. We're going to find out. <laughs> and she, serious growth, boys. And she's actually still here to tell the tale, which is amazing. Yeah. Kate Safe. Yeah. Well, that's incredible. Five to 60 something plus staff. Yeah, 60 plus staff. Well, how do you know who they are, you know? Oh, hell. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny, what, what's your name? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. By the crates. <laughs> They're coming in by the busload. No, actually, we had three Amandas, four Kate, oh. three Sarahs. Not kidding. So they mostly had the same name. Yeah, yeah. We just had to have a crack. So you just, yeah. Have, yeah, just throw one out there and see who turns. <laughs> yes, yes, you. And Shark Tank was actually 2017. They only released it on the internet in 2020. That's probably why you think it's 2020. Yeah. 2020. Mm. Well, I noticed the discrepancy there when I was sort of looking at it. Because I saw an interview, I that think, would, talk, yeah. That would 
align with the timeline a bit more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I your, your intro didn't make sense. You, um, you know, Kate won the business award in 2018, but then went on Shark Tank 2020. I didn't want to say anything. And, and it was the Telstra Business Award. Yeah, so it wasn't just a bloody business award. It was the business, business award. award. Yeah, the <laughs> business award, and I don't write the intro. So <laughs> ben writes the intro. <laughs> do, do you know the other update? We just yes. won the Telstra Business Award for Victoria last month for 2022. Oh, so wow. 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 That's awesome. Awesome. Well, that's they're, live. They're the, that's Good. They're the awards, you know. There's a lot of awards flicking. We've even got a couple on our boardroom table. <laughs> but <laughs> not, not the Telstra ones. Not the Telstra ones. <laughs> not yet. We're working on it. Telstra is a big one for sure. Thanks for coming on, Kate. <laughs> My pleasure. This Thanks is for awesome. having me. And just the intros might need a might need to lift the cog. Yeah, we- <laughs> <laughs> Where are we? No, um, no, nah, nah, that's awesome. What we like to do is build a bit of context first. We like to build the underdog and get that story out of the way and then spend time where we want to spend time. So I want to touch on childhood, early health and parental influence. Yeah. Um, you know, in our research, there's some amazing stuff there. So early on, the first eight years of your life, in and out of hospital, chronic stomach pains, yes. not sure not sure what they are, what's going on with them, and even doctors saying to you incorrect diagnoses and yeah. that sort of thing, which must have been crazy frustrating. Yeah, and as a parent now, thinking my kids are seven and nine, and having a kid, your parents must constantly have, sick. Yeah, mm. yeah, it was horrible. Your parents yeah. must have gone through hell during that time, and then it took until you were 19, 20 years of age until technology got to a point where they had MRIs and they could actually see uh, the tumor. Yeah, in the end, and yeah. then they were able to operate on it. That's right, and I think actually there was a sense of relief being pretty naive as you are at nineteen. Mm. I was like. God, I hope they find something really bad this time because I'm sick of being told that there's nothing wrong with me. And yeah. then when they – they, um, I've been working my seven casual jobs. I come home from a, a nightclub at Crown Casino that I was working at, managing a bar at 6 a.m. in the morning, went for my scan at 8 when they open, fell asleep for seven hours, and I woke up to – there's no mobile phones back then – the um, – voicemail messages and there's seven of them from the doctor at three o'clock in the Arvo saying you've got to come straight back it's urgent this and that and I was like oh I hope it's good (laughs) (laughs) and um, went back in there they're like yep we need to get you in for emergency surgery and I was like cool my calendar is booked for two weeks um got my 20th birthday coming up and uh (laughs) that's in two weeks time and um very um selfishly I was doing an inside sport um you know stupid promo modeling thing as you do as a kid and and um, I'd gotten to the finals and the finals of that weekend and I said, no, nope, I've got a modelling competition. If you're going to chop me up and I can oh. never show my stomach again, <laughs> I'm getting this out of the way. And I ended up coming runner up and um, now I have a, a scar that's kind of like an upside down smiley face. So you could call it a frown. <laughs> yeah. The whole way from here to here. Yeah, so, yeah. Because that was yeah. five hours of surgery. Yeah. They found the problem. They stitched you up, patched you up. Yeah. Off you go. But 20 years... Yeah, it was it was pretty intense because I think at the time as well, I'd kind of had, you know, my 20th birthday, we'd hired this restaurant. It was like my last hurrah. I ended up in hospital that night because I got really sick um, at the end of the party, fortunately. And um, knowing that I was sort of going in for this operation, they told my parents it was a 10% chance of death. Um, so, you know, survival oh, yeah. rate mm. was Hard 90%. To hear. But yeah. I remember waking up on that Sunday, came out of hospital, and I thought, I'm going to go for a big run along the beach. And back then, I actually wasn't a runner. I run now, but um, I just thought, I'm going to run until I can't run anymore. And I ran 13 kilometres, which, if you guys are runners, that might not seem like nothing. But when you <laughs> no. run a runner, I felt like I'd yeah. run to the end of the earth. <laughs> and it was dark by the yeah. time I finished. And but my partner at the time picked me up and, um, the next day when I went into hospital, I kind of, uh, you know, had that empty thought where I was like, I think I've done everything. What if I don't wake up? Huh. Like it was pretty full on and I had my little sister and my grandma and my parents there and, you know, they, they sat with me and I wasn't properly conscious for sort of four or five days because they had me on so many meds afterwards. And my actual 20th birthday was three or four nights in after the surgery And on that night after visitors had left on TV, the barley bombing started. So I'm in this bed. I can't sit myself up. I've got a remote control to lift me up and down. I'm tied to all these medications, drainage tubes, catheters, all this stuff going, I can't even move if the bombs were to come to Australia. And it was terrifying. It was the lowest moment I've ever had. Yeah, yeah. That's that's crazy. That's crazy. And 
we sort of love it because it, it, it it's that that adversity that people go through feel like that can be a that massive re- builds that resilience builds the resilience and can push you into push you into the future dramatically quickly growing up as a family and having all those health issues your parents didn't have much money no they, they didn't have any money actually so um, yeah. mum has a pre-love clothing shop that she's had for 35 years in Rosebud in case anyone's in the area. Yeah. Um, okay, Michael, Michael yeah. for me. Yeah. Get down there. Yeah. Dad's knife sharpener. If anyone needs okay. his knife nice. sharpener, it used to be mobile 30 years ago, but yep. since he couldn't afford a new van, he just has a dead van at the front of the house and they sharpen knives from home or you can drop yep. them off that's at the pre amazing. clothing shop. So oh, okay, good to know. That's mum and dad's business. But they've also yeah. they've been entrepreneurial though, right? Yeah, done their own business thing. Yeah. And look, dad started, he, he actually had an amazing career with, you know, wine and TNT and all of that. And then... And he decided he was going to start his own business and it failed and we lost everything. We just kept, um, you know, one of the cars and um, the, the house that we were living in and the mortgage and they sold, you know, they had an investment and another car and whatever. And he opened the newspaper and said, we just need to be able to pay the school fees and bought the first business that he could afford, which was a mobile knife sharpening van, never been into knife sharpening. He was yeah, yeah. a businessman for TNT. <laughs> and um, yeah, so he tried his own business and failed the first time. And second time, he's like, I just need to pay the bills. So yeah, amazing. Yeah. But he didn't amazing. give up, did he? Well, he, he didn't run off and get a job. Yeah, he yeah. didn't work for anyone. He still went for himself. <laughs> Good on him. And back then, I can tell you, pre love clothing was not sexy. <laughs> it is now. But back then, I was the kid that was teased at school because I never had a new piece of clothing. Oh, I, yeah. I, I had everyone else's hand me downs from the whole peninsula. So. <laughs> Kids going, I think yeah. we took that. <laughs> get check so, the tag, someone else's yeah. name on it. Do you know, oh. all I ever wanted for my birthday was a brand new piece of clothing. Yeah. And, um, um, I asked Dad, I wanted a surf piece of clothing. So my best girlfriend, she had all these surf T-shirts and she w- had so many, she wore them as 90s to go to bed. So I'd want to sleep at her house, particularly during the <laughs> week. So then I could keep the T-shirt, take it with me on the weekend, wear it to a party. Yeah. So that was <laughs> Pretend you're taking it home to watch it. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. But what, what I did learn is the messaging from your parents to you and your sister seemed pretty, you can be anything, you can do anything if you put the work in. Yeah. Just remember that? Is that is that is that, that is was that big? Exactly it. So yeah. dad always said to us, it doesn't matter what you do, but you need to love it firstly, because mm. he always hated what he did. He had to work to be able to pay for us to go to school and whatever else, but he he never loved what he did and, and that made him really sad. And even now he's so ridiculously proud of me and my sister. It's like a shrine at their house of every certificate, <laughs> every newspaper thing. And like, it's embarrassing when they go out because they take the newspaper cutting or this with all their friends. Um, they'll show anyone who's in. <laughs> Interested. But they know my sister and I love what we do. And if you love it, you mm. want to be the best at it. So, um, yeah. And they also know the adversity them. that you've been through and, and the, 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 yeah, you guys have had to on your own go yeah. out and figure it out. And, yeah. and we know from uh, your story, Kate, that you've gone to the very top of your industry as well. So it's not like you've just sort of launched another business like this business is changing lives and I'm sure we'll get to it later and and you've got big plans to continue to do that which is yeah it's pretty wild I'd be proud too (laughs) (laughs) I'll bring you and and, and, and I love that messaging from from your uh, parents as well because I've got three kids and I kind of found myself in your dad's situation as well Pete as well somewhat but Mm. you know we were shop fitters for years and I did it and I learned to love it a bit but I never was in love with it and we were late well, you know, we pivoted late because we we just had to try and find something else and, and make that change. And that's the exact sort of kind of messaging that I'm trying to pass on, which is, hey, find something that you love. And then as long as you work hard, anything's possible. And my kids walk around the house going, anything. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That's so, hardcore. That's yeah, it's hardcore. just hardcore. So it's almost yeah, yeah. ingrained into them. Yeah. yeah. All so, right. So we've had the operation. Mm-hmm. Life Sounds like it opened up. Yeah. Let's go. And you, you know, you went and studied dietitian, uh, and then you started a business as well. You got your clinics down on the down on the peninsula. If you want to sort of start us there as a, yeah. as far as an entrepreneur and a, a businesswoman. Yeah. So uh, I guess my first time selling stuff, we. Um used to sell stuff out the front of our house, my sister and I. So I think there's a photo of me selling lollies, of all things, yeah. when I'm like five years old, out the front of our house on a busy main road. I'm like, not sure that's safe. <laughs> next, to the, hey, next to the knife cool. truck. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, by the time I was 14 and nine months, I had my first 
two or three casual jobs. By the time I was 18, I had seven casual jobs. My sister, who's two and a half years younger than me, she just took the seven casual jobs that I had. She started at 11 because they kind of thought she was me because we looked similar at the time, except she's got darker hair and we'd fill in for each other. So by the time I was 20 and she was still in high school at 17, we bought our first investment property. We had three by the within the next two years. And um, it was, you know, banks wouldn't lend us money, talking about banks and money and cash flow and whatever. So I just heckled anybody who would listen about getting a loan. And there was one silly guy who just kept picking up the phone in Mornington. <laughs> Peter Ritchie had wizard home loans oh, yeah, at the time. Yeah, they, yeah. I don't think they're around anymore. I, I don't know. Yeah, no, anyway. Gone, yeah. yeah. And he... Um, because I was, I was lending money to <laughs> miners. <laughs> 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 Shout out Richie. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he actually just kept answering the phones. I just kept hassling him, kept medium catching the bus because I was saving money on fuel because you wouldn't drive to Mornington mm. and waste all your <laughs> fuel money in your car. You got the bus for 45 cents and um, yeah, he gave us the first loan and he's like, what are you going to buy? And I was like, oh, I want to buy a house. And he's like, oh, where? And I was like, I don't know. Tell me you'll give me the money and I'll find yeah. you one. <laughs> and that was it. So Jane and that and was at 20? Yeah. Wow. And she was 17. She was still in high school and yeah, he's yeah. like, are you sure I should be loaning you money? I was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> be fine. I've got so many... Uh, I don't know if you say this on air, but we got lots of cash tips from our seven casual jobs because we were working hospitality, catering, yeah, yeah. bakeries. Like you get tips at the end of every shift. So you'd have not just your savings from your actual workings, but all the tips. And if you worked hard, like catering jobs could be 15 hours at a wedding, like, you know, from setup, yeah. from skewering raw chicken to putting, you know, chairs and polishing cutlery to the end of the night when you're cleaning up the stuff and putting it all away. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, do you, yeah. Kate, do you think your resilience come from those early days of, of being crook and then always wanting to find out what was wrong? Where does it come from? Yeah, that, that was always interesting. Um, in high school when everyone's sort of working out what they want to be and I was like, oh, I have no idea. And my friend's like, you're kidding me. All you talk about is food. I love food and I have the biggest appetite for a small female. Um, I could eat uh, – any of the men under the table, you know, back then, mm. uh, boys. And, um, yeah, they're like, of course you're going to do something with food. You love food. And I was like, yeah, what? And then when I sort of started thinking about it, I was like, I want to understand why the doctors think food's bad for me and why they think food's making me sick because I don't feel bad when I eat. I feel bad when I get sick, but the sickness didn't feel like it was about the food. Mm. So I think that was my interest because I was like, I feel like food is good for us and it's nutrition and it makes us well. But the doctors are saying, oh, no, you've got a tummy ache because you ate something bad. And I was like, like what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It'd be yeah. frustrating. Yeah, it was but you, But you knew deep down, you you know, <laughs> I, th I think I heard you say, people know, you know, you know yourself. Yeah, you, you know. know you, you know yourself better wrong. than any other external external mm. person and you knew that the food wasn't the issue. Yeah, and it, sadly, sort of six months after I'd had my operation, there was a girl that I was working at the surf shop with at the time and she was talking about all these tummy pains and then she was all itchy all over her skin and they investigated, couldn't find anything and in the end they put her in a psych ward because she'd scratched off all over her skin mm. and her, even her whole family thought she was crazy, this poor girl, and it turned out she had pancreatic cancer and you've actually got a 90% death rate with that, not survival rate. And she lived but her scar was like here to here. At least mine was here to here so I could cover it. Mm. Yeah. So, and I knew there was something wrong with her because I knew no one believed me yeah. and she was in the same situation six months after and I said, never stop looking. Yeah, and that's yeah. part of part of your drive to the go and edu educate yourself, start your businesses and yeah. Even when they out. say no to the loan. Yeah. No to the loan. Just keep ringing. Just keep ringing, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's, a, that's a, Don't very, give up. a good, never give up. Mm. It's kind of the, the shark away. tank story next. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't give up. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so. What, what does Benny always say? Always chase the nose? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, don't be scared don't of the nose. Don't be scared nose. of the nose. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, like, because people, it's like, especially like a good analogy is sales, right? Yeah. That's, so people are scared of the no, so they're, they're, they're really tentative around asking the, the tough questions. But the reality is you want to get the no's. Because as, no. yeah, as soon as you get the no's, then you, you realise, okay, well, they're a no, so I can put my focus else, elsewhere. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So like Chase that. the no's. So you bought the house with the sister. Yes. Which is, fan, you know, businesswoman. Yep. Savage getting into it. <laughs> what, what happens from there? Studies- 
businesses? Yeah. So, yeah, did my degrees, you know, nutrition, dietetics, exercise science. I did a master's in clinical exercise physiology, my diabetes education. More recently, I've done my MBA because I thought if I'm going to run a business, I better know something about it, um, particularly money. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think then my dietitian business just happened um, because I oh, I started personal training. That was the start of it. I'm working at an educa- education ed- education institute, writing nutrition courses and teaching them. And I just found I was personal training before and after hours at this stage. And I thought, why am I not, like I'm making enough money from the PT. So I went into that and I said to dad, I'm actually going to quit my full-time job and um, start PT and start my own dietitian business. And he's like, with what, like how? (laughs) And I was like, oh, I've, I've got like 10 clients. They all said they'd back me. They'll do three sessions each week that covers the rent and I'll build it from there. He's like, nope. He got scared, I think, because he'd lost his full-time job, yeah, tried mm. to start business and it failed the first time. Mm. And he just said, do not do it. You're getting more money. My wage then was like 60 grand, which was like his dream salary that I don't think he'd ever got in his lifetime yeah. as well. Mm. And he's like, how could you give that away? And I was like, I know I can make this work. So I signed a lease and started my own gym and then the dietitian stuff just came. As soon as I finished my degree, I started consulting and within probably two years, I had 23 staff with my gym and um, all different health services. You know, we had, I don't know, everything, physios, osteos, podiatrists, everyone there. And um, it was only after I gave birth to my first child and I was working 23 hours a day pretty much, (laughs) even when I was breastfeeding in the middle of the night that I went, what is this baby in my arm? Oh, that's right. I had a baby and I forgot because I'm so busy. So I sold off the gym part of the business to Australia's leading exercise physiology company at the time and I kept the dietitian part. So we consult to 11 medical centres and three private hospitals and I still have that today. And, you know, when you know what it is that you do well and that you love, it's easy to focus on that. But sometimes you go too broad because Mm. you see little opportunities but they're not the right thing. So that's probably... One of my biggest tips is really hone in on what you love and what you're really good at and forget about the periphery. Yeah, quality, quality, not quantity. Quality, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, then the next step, I guess, was we were working, uh, one of our uh, consultants that we work with was a weight loss surgeon and he basically, um, him and I had the same alignment in that we didn't actually believe in bars and shakes for rapid weight loss. We didn't believe that people should just drink chocolate shakes and that'll solve all their problems, particularly if they're going for weight loss surgery because they're going to wake up from the surgery and even though they lose weight over the first few years, at some point their metabolism slows down again, they start regaining weight. So if you never taught them how to eat, they think the answer is chocolate milkshakes again and that's no quality of life and it's really not good for mental health it's not good for gut health you're not chewing things all those sorts of things and it's not real food it's powder in a packet so we wanted to create Australia's first real food VLCD or very low calorie diet where these people that were initially going for weight loss surgery could actually eat three wholesome meals with, you know, four to 12 veggies, high protein, low carb. And those recipes were my family recipes that I mm. still cook today with my kids, like <clears throat> a chili con carne, a wholemeal beef lasagna, or a, mm. a protein bolognese. It's just the kids at home will have more rice and pasta with it. And our meals that we sell at Beef Fit Food are very much the, the low carb version of that but it's still got all the hidden low-carb veggies, so you won't know the veggies are in there, but there's heaps of them. (laughs) And um, we teach adults how to eat veggies again and how to eat well. So that really evolved from just being for weight loss surgery to all of a sudden – People were literally going. Everyone wants to lose weight. Yeah, everyone yeah. wants to lose <laughs> weight. But people had thought yeah. they'd had surgery and they go, no, 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 I haven't had the surgery. And they're like, mm, you have had the surgery. Look <laughs> at how much weight you've lost and how yeah. quickly. And they're like, no, I've been eating this food. So this secret started mm-hmm. spreading about this food people were eating. And I was like, no, 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 you can't have the food. It's only for surgery. And they're like, but we don't want surgery. We just want to eat well. And so then I sort of did some soul searching because I thought, is it okay to sell people a low calorie diet? And I was like, actually, OptiFast is a available everywhere. You know what I mean? Protein mm. shakes are available everywhere and people use them without any guidance. And I was like, well, if I provide free dietitian support, which is what we do at Be Fit Food, we can actually guide people how to eat small, nutritious meals and get the first five kilos off. So on average, our customers lose 5.89 kilos in 14 days. And that's on average. That's an average 84 kilo person loses that much weight if there's 100% compliance. So 
we know that it can do no harm. If my kids can eat it, I can eat it. We just mm. eat other stuff as well, you know. You just yeah. have other stuff. But the food is just food. It can't do any harm. So once I was comfortable with that, we started um, – selling to anyone who wanted it. I mean, you put it on the internet and you can't <laughs> stop people yeah. buying it. So Correct. I was going to ask, is it in individualised or is it in like categories of certain weight division? Is it, is it like a male, so female, it, then weight building division? building blocks. So yeah. what we do is, so every meal is a small 250 calorie meal with a minimum of 20 to 30 grams of protein and a maximum of 15 to 20 grams of carbs. And so like a, a female who, who needs to lose weight, who's really inactive, might have three meals a day, two protein snacks. A male might have four meals a day, two protein snacks. But there's no limit. You can have five, you can have six or mm. what we actually recommend recommend so it's cheaper for people is have your three meals a day to cover all of your nutritional requirements then just have half a cup of nuts half an avocado have whatever else you want to have your soy latte and just fit within our parameters so we give them a list of their recommended extras and every person that we service gets a free dietitian consultation and that was the way that I felt comfortable Mm. with people eating this food and we're the only company that has dietitians that consult for free and in my other company we charge 150 bucks for that but at BeFit Food I wasn't comfortable selling food without knowing that it was personalised and that people Mm. would get the results and that it wasn't a risk. Yeah, how good is that? Yeah, End of the game. Amazing. And this is B-Fit food that we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. So talk about that in the early stages and just business and some of the problems you might have faced. <laughs> the the pains. Well, the, let's start with the, I have no like, idea about yeah, business. Because it's all delivery, right? Like you purchase online delivery. and then wherever there, you've got to have kitchen scattered and it's get the, yeah, that's a nightmare. That's so crazy. It starts from concept <laughs> where the surgeon says to me, this idea of doing food instead of shakes is great. Do you mm. want to cook it? And I was like, cool, I've got a newborn. I'm pregnant with the second one. I've got 11 medical centres and three private hospitals that I'm managing. But yeah, I'll cook the food. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, so started cooking food. And next thing you know, we've hired a kitchen, we've got five staff and it's getting busy and, you know, we're trying to route it and we're trying to get delivery companies, we're trying to source suppliers and I'm like, we're hemorrhaging money. Anytime anyone buys food, it was like we gave them $10 with it, like uh. buy the food and have $10 <laughs> as well. Because, because of your time cooking the, the actual yeah, food, delivery. Australian shout costs. in the country. Yeah, shout in the country <laughs> wow. to get healthy. Eat, eat yourself healthy on our yeah, <laughs> yeah, pay yeah, for yeah. it. And so then that's when I sort of figured we're digging a big hole, like a big money pit and- We were doing good and I think that's hard when you're getting the pat on the back, this really works, this is so good. But So the results are good from the people using it. But the economics make money out of it. Yeah. And that's why I went on Shark Tank. That's honestly the only reason because I was like, this works, people love it. We need to make more of it, but how do we make this viable? And we just didn't know. And I think you don't know what you don't know. And that was going on Shark Tank for me was really, it was two things. One was finding a business mentor. And the second thing was for me to commit 100%. So I put a general manager into my dietitian business and that, you know, they run that really well. And I had to commit 110% to this, mm. give birth to the second child first and then <laughs> um, take them on the journey with me. So, yeah. How, how's the Shark Tank uh, cross, your, cross your desk sort of thing? Obviously, we all sort of know that Shark Tank exists. Oh, sure. How did that come to the forefront to go as a solution? So when I was 19, the banks wouldn't loan me money. I was <laughs> yeah. like, banks don't give you money. Peter Ritchie's already <laughs> yeah. given me He's already three out. money <laughs> worth, you know, three investment properties. I'm Who like, else where else do you find money? Oh, that show. They give you money on the show. Dead set. That's that, what that's I did. That's a simple. Yeah, yeah, did, yeah. Were you an the avid show. watcher of the show? No, no. Not I've really? just seen no, a couple of times. But yeah. when I went to audition, because the surgeon said to me, um, obviously it's super risky for our mm. reputations and everything else. If it goes bad, they annihilate you and they try and humiliate you. So it could actually destroy our careers as professionals. Who did professionals. your evaluation? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you so, know your numbers? Do you know your numbers? <laughs> well, yeah. for three months before the show um, was filmed, I actually watched every episode ever met, made. I've got a notebook taking notes of every question ever asked and I started looking to find those answers. So then when I flew in the night before and it's obviously nothing like it looks like on the show, yeah. you know, um, you've flown in the night before, you're bloody tired and you sort of get woken up at six in the morning. You're going on set in a few hours and you're like, cool, so who's going to prep me? Oh, no, 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 you just walk out there and you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. Two hours and 45 minutes later, standing on the red carpet in front of five shots, that are literally trying to eat me alive by myself because the surgeon was warned 
Vi's lawyer, don't go on TV. It'll be bad for your reputation. Yeah. Just send her. So oh, he's, I bet you he's the best. Official lamb. He'd be kicking himself yeah, now yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the end, he comes out for proof oh, of concept. Oh, he did too. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. They had sort of put this deal on the table, but I was terrified that I was going to accept something on behalf of both of us because yeah. we were 50-50 in this business. Mm. And, you know, everything that I did, there was no breaks in this two hours and 45 minutes. I could barely remember my own name, let alone what I was saying. So they're trying making, to wear you down. Yeah, rational decisions at that point. So I brought Jeff out and um, I was like, please take some of this burden. Like I'm <laughs> fried. And um, in the end we couldn't decide and I was just like, we'll go with Janine because we had a couple of offers on the table and all I knew was I'd gone on the show to get advice and a business mentor from Je- – and Janine was a person who stood out. She did food. She did she, food, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and she had a really cool story too. Her book's incredible too. Um, so that was – the only and thing she's passionate like, about health and nutrition and all that kind of stuff yeah, as well, isn't she? Yeah, and scale. Mental. She gets scale. Oh, she knows how to scale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And What's that? Yeah, so that was it. But um, talking about um, taking no for an answer. So after Shark Tank, once again, very naive. I was like, cool, we get the photo with Janine. Where's the big check? Is it a yeah. big one? How much <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> and um, I was like, I'm cool with the little check. Any check's a good check. Yeah. Um, there is no check. Do you need the numbers? There's no check. There's no check. <laughs> what do you mean? They the month said- after. No, no, there's no check. And I was like, two months later, is it going to air? Are we going to get a check? Oh. No, no, no. they got to do due diligence. And I was like, oh, okay, what do they need? Nine months went on, no money, no every single month. Basically, no, it's the end, don't come back type stuff. And I I didn't hear that last part. So I was like, I'm coming back. But I heard the no, but we're just going to try again. We're going to keep trying until this makes sense. It hadn't gone to air. We kept getting told, you know, it was filmed in November. It'll go to air January, February, March. And then every other show kept trumping it with whatever. Maybe it was MasterChef or whatever's Mm. on that channel. You know, bigger and better shows were coming out. And eventually it um, goes, we find out it's going to air in two nights. We're like, oh, cool, maybe something the will happen. Yeah, <laughs> maybe there's some money coming. And sure enough, when it goes to air as well, I'd been preparing all year for this to go to air. So I said to my team, you know, we only had five people at the time, let's let's make a heap of food because we're going to sell a heap of food. And at the time we are probably doing about up to 1,000 meals a week, which I thought was pretty good. That's a lot of meals. And I told my team, I said, look, we've got to make sure we make like 800 boxes of this rapid weight loss kit, just the one week kit, because I reckon that's what's going to sell. And the team like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the production manager at the time, he's like, "Mm, yeah. And I was like, I don't think you're on board with this, but that's okay. So looking around the kitchen, I'm like, where's all this food? And I've got a warehouse at this stage, got a big, you know, container freezer. Where's the food? Couldn't find it anywhere. We're watching it that night and we're watching the um, Google Analytics on the website. And I was like, oh, look, there's 100 people online. We've never had more than 30. And I was like, oh, there's 1,000, 10,000, 60,000. Oh, my God, I hope they don't try and buy. (laughs) So I'm going to the chef. So how much food have we got? Is it the 800 boxes? We're going to have to stop selling soon. And he's like, I thought you were full of shit. (laughs) Like, that's what he said. And he goes, I only made 200. We sold 2,500 and and no one knew how to turn off the website. And the website crashed every two to four minutes. So we didn't have a chance to turn it off, even if we could figure out how to yeah. turn it off. We just kept selling food. So I thought, oh, I'll go into the office and see if there's any voicemail messages. <laughs> so I'd borrowed off a friend those VoIP phones, the voiceover oh, internet yeah, phones, yeah, plug yeah. them into every wall yeah. there. Every single phone was going off its head and had hundreds of calls. And I was like, <gasps> oh. we'll deal with this tomorrow because it's like 11.30 <laughs> at night. And I was like, I wonder if anyone will turn up tomorrow. I pull up to the office and there's literally maybe a kilometre line of cars, bucks, what? buses, trucks. People wow. have come from all around Australia because at the time we only delivered in Victoria and they thought they'll jump on a plane or they'll drive down and pick up their box of food that we had. Oh, no. But we didn't have it. Oh. So that was a wow. disaster. So it was a good, we told people like the wait was going to be, you know, six weeks plus mm. and we offered everyone a refund and 90% of people waited. Yeah. Only 10% of people said, I'll have my money back and everyone else waited and some Incredible. poor people had to wait about three months mm. because there was just no way human beings could cook that much food. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't just the orders from that night. People kept reordering yeah. and we're like, no, you've got to stop the yeah. orders. And then my poor team that went from, you know, the five people with one girl who was literally the only 
only operations admin, take your orders, know how to use the website person and the four people in the kitchen to uh, 63 people because the printer just kept spitting out stuff. We kept packing orders and we had to figure it out and, yeah, um, yeah, broke it all and then had to rebuild it properly. How's the the cut through from the show though, right? Like, Um, I have no idea how many viewers they get on Mm. For the show, but seven hundred eighty-five thousand. That's a lot. I feel it. Yeah, it sounds like yeah. a fair few of them. Yeah, cut the, like the percentage which goes. We to know shows. sixty thousand hit the website That's wild. immediately, and then you know thousands of them went through to purchase. But the website was offline That's for weeks That's on ten, end. That's nearly ten percent. Of yeah, people that were watching it, which is much. Good return on investment. That's, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So, Kate, I guess for me, like when when it's going to air. So you've been running the business, waiting for this check. You're, you're losing money losing for nine money. months. Oh yeah. So and the easy doctors thing and have... surgeons don't make the same money, right? So oh. I was matching the surgeon dollar for dollar in the business until I literally, I was like, I don't have a cent. Like I have two children and a, basically a newborn. I was like. I can't put any more money in and I didn't want to lose my percent in the business. And that was the Mm. other reason to go on Shark Tank. I was like, I need someone else to put money in because I can't, I don't have anything else to put in. And I didn't have a way of stopping losing money. A lot of people would have just given up though. In that nine months, they would have said, this is getting too hard. I'm I'm X amount, you know, out of of pocket. And you you just said, (laughs) that resilience from those early days, you said, I'm going to stick around and do whatever I can to float for nine months, wait for it to go to air. Yeah. And then tell us that feeling of that night where it went to air and the website's crashing. Is it like, is it obviously scary, but. Yeah, don't. You've done it, it. It's exhilarating. Yeah, it's kind of like, wow. And I think they're the moments that as human beings, you don't appreciate or sit in that moment long mm. enough you get this little oh, this is amazing and then you just get the panic of oh <laughs> what have I done how <laughs> have I this? like the disaster how, how about Janine was she there to support you the, she that, hadn't the next invested day? then oh, so she, it was a month after it went to air that she invested because after, she had after the she orders had, come in <laughs> she's seen the orders well, they, they need to do the due diligence right yeah. to, to basically confirm the stuff that you told them was true because you That's could right. you can potentially get up there and yeah. Put out whatever numbers you like. Or, the, or they just wait for the show to blow it up and then they go, I'm in, Kate, I'm in. Now I'm in. And being smarter about business and money now, I get why she didn't put her money in. It mm. was a money pit. And after it went to air, it, it was better. Yeah. Um, didn't mean we knew how to run it back then, but nobody would have. And I think mm. it probably took me two or three years to really get some confidence to run the business. I kept... Yep thinking that there was a miracle person that you could hire and it's I still think that sometimes I always doubt myself and I go there's got to be someone who knows how to do this better than me and then I go back and I look at all the mistakes I've made and every time you make a mistake you have a really good learning from Mm, it and if people haven't made those mistakes and haven't felt how bad Mm. that feels they can't actually make better decisions so I think the only better people to run it are the people that they probably have to have had their own business before they have to have had the threat of losing their house losing Mm. everything to actually care enough to make it work Mm. yeah we've all been there it's not Mm. nice I the bit, the bit that I grabbed from that, you, you're going on Shark Shark Tank. You've got this opportunity, but it sounds like you did the work. It sounds yeah. like you rolled the sleeves up. You you went back through the past episodes. Every question mm-hmm. that could be asked of you, yeah. you went and studied. Even though it sounds like you know you're a bit fried on the stage, but yeah. no doubt that hard work set you in really good stead to deliver something that ultimately you got investment in. They aired it. You know, the rest is history. But I think you you had the opportunity and you did the work. Yeah, and that is the key. You always have to do the work. There is no shortcut. And uh, I was reading the Samantha Wills, if you know her jewellery company. Anyway, she's got an incredible book called From Gold to Dust or something like that. And the same thing, people think it's an overnight success or whatever else, but they don't see the bleeding fingers, the calluses. She worked 23 hours a day to fill orders all around the world as this thing went out of control. She's got all these actresses wearing it and it's just her running the whole thing behind the scenes with these bleeding hands, you know? (laughs) Yeah. It's... um, yeah, it's, it's, you've got to put the work in. It's real, isn't it? Because yeah. you've gone, you, you you did it quite quickly. Your you know your growth and your scale was really quite.
quite quickly, but yeah. managing that and navigating that and bringing people on and bringing good people on. Yeah. We talk to a lot of people on here that that they have those same issues. And and what are your thoughts? Getting good people around you, delegating, yeah. passing passing the tasks on. The daily can, tasks. Can I even yeah, go so before, are you wearing every hat at the start? Because I know in our business, yeah. we're all trying to wear every hat and yeah. it just, you can't be the best at what you do. Is that no, sort of where oh, you- Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because I guess it's hard to give direction even or even know who to hire if you don't even know what these things are like you know seven years ago when this all started I knew nothing about social media or digital marketing or even websites Mm. like it you know you didn't have to know so you didn't know so it's hard to know who to hire as Mm. well so you don't know other people are experts in things until you figure out how bad you are at it (laughs) and then you go yeah there's got to be someone who does this so how bad you are how bad you need it yeah and I've got to I've got to actually acknowledge this and I've got to I've got to pass it on to someone else. Exactly. So how do you yeah. think you went during those times as far as delegating? Are you good at good at delegating, good at getting out of the way and letting those guys muck it up for a bit and make their mistakes? Is that yeah, something I'm that comes easy? Yeah, I'm pretty accepting and um, <laughs> you might, this is a pretty funny example. Just last week alone, my digital marketing manager put out a post and it had the wrong image on it with the wrong price. And he's oh. like, oh, my God, you're going to kill me. I'm going to be, like, packing orders all weekend and this and that. <laughs> I was like, you know what? It, Who cares? It, It's a mistake. Mistakes happen. I'm probably too forgiving, but everybody has their chance to make a mistake. Just don't make it again. And Janine always said that to me too. You'll always be forgiven the first time. So having someone, you know, believe in you that it's okay and accept that you're going to make mistakes as long as you come back from them and you don't make them again. If you don't learn from your mistake, Mm. you're gone. But (laughs) learn from the mistakes. Have you had to have many of those tough conversations as well? Yeah, yeah. And that's that's the bit that I really hate actually. I don't like it. Heavens, I I have a sister who's (laughs) incredible. Incredible at HR because um, I can't do it. It actually breaks me as a person Same. and as a leader too. So I've had lots of, you know, different sorts of coaching bits and pieces and people telling me, you know, you need to be this type of leader and I try and be that person and I'm a fragment of a human and I just, it breaks me. Mm. So I've got a pretty unique leadership style. I'm super optimistic, super passionate on 24-7 and it comes with its all its other flaws, which means I have to delegate because mm. the attention to detail detail is only there in the things that matter most, not in the little things. And those little things might matter to someone else. But to me, the things I'm going to pick up is, I don't know, if um, a pallet only has, you know, 57 layers of cartons because I'm, I'm used to looking at it and I know that every carton's worth X amount of dollars. Like I see weird things. Like mm. in my numbers, I see everything. <laughs> so my accountant and I sit there every month. I go, that's not right. That's not right. And he's like, oh, it's only off by a percent. And I go, yeah, it's definitely not right. Like, and I will find it. Sounds like you've uh, <clears throat> you've bunkered into the numbers, the business side, which is the most important. We were talking cash flow yeah. early on and how important that is. But it sounds like you've got a good handle of, yeah. The numbers. The, the numbers, which is, yeah, critical. You only get the handle of the numbers and you lose control <laughs> yeah. of the numbers and then you have to- I was about to say, did you control. always have control of yeah. the numbers? Never had control. Like we started at a loss, you know, yeah. like a massive loss. So yeah. controlling the numbers is a day by day thing and it never stops. And I now the, um, I guess a lot of people talk about count the cents and the dollars take care of themselves. And I think I'm starting to really appreciate that because it is the 10 cents on something here or there when you've got 30,000 meals you're delivering a week that actually matters more than the $100 that you spend on office works on printing because your printer's broken. Like, you know, and that's where um, that style of leadership is pretty organic to me that I don't care if you go spend a hundred bucks on X, but I do care about the 10 cents here and this and that because they're <clears throat> cumulative, they're repetitive, and mm. they're the things that make the big dints yes. in the, the P&L or the balance sheet. And that's knowing your business, isn't it? Yeah. That's knowing your business to a level that that dollar doesn't affect me, but yeah. these cents affect me. Yeah. And like you say, the repetition, it starts to scale. You let 10 cents go, you let 20 cents go, suddenly 80 cents per unit. Yeah. And suddenly you're chasing chasing tail. Yeah. And I'm sure with you guys being tradies too, it's that bill of materials. It's the, yeah. the nuts and bolts of everything that actually makes Especially the Especially the, the these days. I mean, like the yeah. businesses, how many businesses are going under as builders at the moment? Yeah. It's because of fixed price contracts. It's just really 
really bad. Um, I, I guess, Kate, so we've, I want to go back as well to when we've gone from five staff to 60 plus staff. I'm guessing with the five staff, you had a great culture. Everyone worked really well together. When you've grown it that quick, how do you how do you keep that good culture and how do you get people to work system in your systems? I guess how do you teach that or or were there systems or there was no systems at the start, so that was easy okay, yeah. and it was awesome. like a party because <laughs> we were going twenty four seven, so everyone was on all the time until they burnt out. Right. So then we had to really strategically. Um, you know, break up teams, break up departments. Because at the start, just everything needed to be done, mm. everything. So it, you couldn't work out what you actually needed until you worked that out, I guess. Yeah, because yeah. there's a new problem every day. Mm. So now, obviously, it's very structured in departments. But to get to that was really scaling back to scale up again too. Mm. So actually back scaling. Back to basics. Yeah. yeah. And, and outsourcing the things that you're not the expert at too. So we outsourced. We were packing our own boxes, warehousing. I wow. at, this, at one stage, I had taken on three warehouses, seven or eight trucks that I plugged into the front of the store and the other warehouses, freezer trucks because we've run yeah. out of freezer storage, <laughs> except I forgot because I'd borrowed a friend's dad's truck licence to <laughs> sort of, you know, get these trucks Driving driven around. down. <laughs> yeah, but I forgot someone had to fill them up, so they all ran out of diesel over the weekend oh, no. <laughs> and the freezers turned off and I was like, oh, my God, who knows how to drive a truck? No one knew how to drive a truck. We just had a licence. <laughs> so I had to call the truck company and say, can I hire a truck driver to just – they only need to go 800 metres yeah. down the road <laughs> to the petrol station up, yeah. yeah, and fuel them all up again. Wow. So, And then things like I kept blowing up the ampage and I know that we have 64 amps in the building at work now because mm. I, I kept plugging in new trucks and freezers bang blown up, blown up. so I know that very well yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how you learn making mistakes yeah, yeah. You, those numbers yep. yeah, yeah you don't yeah. lose them but, pe but yeah. people don't see that do they they no. think that it's bad it's a it's a good business and you're on this crazy journey but when you really peel it back it's it sounds like yeah it's just hard work yeah. isn't it just yeah. showing up hard work figuring stuff out Pivoting, pivoting and surrounding yourself with good people. Yeah, and, and that culture piece yeah. is really the key to it, that if you're optimistic and positive, then everyone around you will be, and that is the hardest thing. If you're having a shit day, mm. you cannot put that on your face. You've got to bring yeah. the other face with you to work Yeah, um, because you can if affect everyone and then in turn that, you know, really – breaks the culture or if you leave someone in the business who is damaging to culture too long and that's something Janine's told me you know you hire slow and fire fast so if uh, you yep. think someone's mm. wrong for the business the Just irreparable damage that they're doing in the background that you don't see so you you need to remove those people for culture yeah that's great yeah. advice all our listeners that one especially mm. rocking up because I know sometimes I get grumpy mm. and, and I, I go to site and you're grumpy like no you've got to get out of this don't don't let it don't pass on to everyone else keep them happy but yeah I like that one slow Higher, higher, slow, slow, higher, higher, fast. higher fast. fast. I haven't heard yeah. one. That's a good one. And it, it is, it's about the gut instinct first because you yeah. kick yourself when you go, I knew. Oh, yeah, I, I knew. knew. And Trust you actually gut. do know because the gut has more neural connections than the brain mm. you had. Can I, you can I ask a question about Janine? Can you t t talk us through the moment after nine months where she did invest but then it hadn't come out so she hadn't really invested <laughs> and then a month, it took a month after the show aired. Yeah. When was the first time you got to sit down with her and really got access to her and it felt like, all right, I'm on here. I've, I'm, yeah. I'm in business with Janine Ellis, which is, which is no it mean feat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, I had quite a few moments of tears in her office where she'd say no and I was like, no, I'm not taking no and then it just gets too much. You're like, I don't have a backup plan. You're my backup plan. <laughs> you know? When you say no, and she said no, I'm pulling out. Yeah, well, she hadn't actually... Invested. There was no contract. She wasn't in. You go on Shark Tank and they say, deal done, but there's no deal until the deal's actually done. So are you, you still know? sort of selling to her after the show, oh, trying yeah. to get yeah, her yeah, on? Yeah, trying to close yeah. it. Yeah, 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 to close yeah there's it. no deal. There's no contract. There's no check until yeah. it, it's done after due diligence and after mm. everything So you're else. still negotiating yeah. after mm. the show. Would they sometimes invest pre? Like, do you think if you were in a better position before it aired, she might have jumped on it earlier? Definitely. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. And I'm sure that does happen because the valuation changed after as of well. Course. I was like, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so whatever you agreed yeah. isn't the deal? Isn't the deal. Uh, no, yeah, so which is changes. good for you. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of her support and mentoring as well, like I got a few hours um, a month face to face and time with her, but actually had her on my phone, on my emails 24-7 like wow. she was and that was in that pre-nine months 
No, that was post. Uh, post. post. Only post. post only once pre commitment. It's done. You're out in the nothing. cold for the nine for that yeah. nine months. That's wild. Yeah. 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 So, and, and I think in hindsight now, hindsight's a wonderful thing. If you knew what was going to happen, everything you'd do differently, mm. and you'd ask better questions and you'd set yourself up. But you you don't know that, and um, yeah. But I can't. You can't un- underestimate actually having someone in your business who's got a thicker skin too. And she always said that she's like, you know, she's got such a thick skin and she can be really hard sometimes but gosh you need that because mm. if you're too soft you get walked all over yeah 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 so how important do you think for anyone else in business to have that that mentor that figure that someone who's backing you in that sounding board mm. all those sort of things how important do you think it is it's really important but you have to take on board what they say yeah, and i think the, the only issues that i had too is sometimes when you weren't ready to do those things <laughs> and then you feel like you're turning up and you're just so shy and embarrassed because you're like, oh, you told me to do this or yeah. fire this person. I just couldn't do it. So <laughs> yeah. And it's super embarrassing. And then they get pretty pissed off mm. with yeah. you. So you've, if you're going to sign up for it, you've got to be committed to or do you've it. You've got to be open to it. Yeah. yeah. And I guess moving forward from that, if you're not going to get another investor in your business, because obviously if you're doing that, you're giving away equity in the business and you know, you've got to make sure the person that invests with you has the same vision, the same goals and, you know, the same outcomes, whatever. Um, But you can look at using groups and we've talked about, you know, your business groups. There's so many of them around, whether it's EO or it's a business chicks or it's a CUB or there's hundreds of them, um, YPOs, whatever. But have your people that you can talk to about because like we're chatting here, every single business goes through the same things. If it's not cash flow, it's people or it's, Mm. yeah, um, whatever. Surround yourself with great people. That's what we always get. Everyone says the same thing. Yeah. Make sure you surround yourself with the right people. They say you're the average of the five people that you yeah. spend the most time wow. with. There you go. So, yeah. So, yeah. A quick question. I'm going all right. Yeah. I'm going all right, eh? <laughs> So, I guess a question, Kate, like the business has taken off and then um, Janine wanted to invest. Could you just said no because you already seen that it was projecting in the right path? But I guess did you want Janine on for that mentor as well? It was just all Janine, about man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, all about that because I still, you know, you might have money in the bank then, and this is before we hadn't any. We didn't know what cash flow problems were. We got all this cash put in the bank, so. I didn't experience that. So you don't need it until you need it. So Mm. it was really good having her for when those things were a problem. She knew what to do and how to guide you. And uh, in saying that, knowing what to do, no one actually knows. It's your business, your decisions too. So I did think and from doing lots of presentations about getting a mentor and bits and pieces, people sometimes think that, oh, no, they came in, come in and do it for you. I thought that. I thought, yeah. go on, Shark Tank, we get, sh- we get a check and she runs a business. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. You can talk to her a couple of times a month, but you need to do it. And yeah. it's like, oh. Mm. So uh, I think, yeah, don't be mistaken thinking the mentor actually does it. They don't. It's probably a bit more rewarding yeah. as well, though, because yeah. your business, you get to do it. Yeah. It's making mistakes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So, be fit food. What's what's next? Oh, we were talking a bit earlier. There are some exciting things that you're starting to unpack and trying to change the trajectory of potentially the way people think and yeah. act and educate people. Is there some exciting things happening? I think the big vision for Be Fit Food eventually is to change the health of Australia and eventually the globe. We've got the trademark in the US, the UK, China, and obviously Australia. We've got lots of different trademarks and bits and pieces, but we know that um, more important than financial health is actually your personal mm. health. And the only thing that you physically put in your body besides air and water is your food. So you are the outcome of what you eat 100%. Mm. And we know that food has more power than medicine. We own the trademark food as the first medicine. And even as a surgeon in the business, having Jeff, um, medicine is only useful when food is managed first. So medicine can't undo a bad diet. Exercise can't undo a bad diet. You actually need to get the diet right first and then everything else will compound and help you on top of that. So our goal is to help people every Australian how to eat better and if they can eat better they'll have better health or need less medication so we're we're really here to disrupt the surgical industry the supplements industry the medical industry the pharmaceuticals and I guess they're the big guys that have 
the money out there, like your Nestle's mm. and whoever else mm. that can advertise all their products and their shakes and their bars and selling you know, the fairy floss. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And the real good stuff is the stuff that they don't want to sell because it's hard to make yeah. and it's Australian labour of real ingredients. Someone has to pick it, mm. wash it, chop it, yeah. cook it, mm. do the time. dishes. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's not fun. Yeah, yeah and then home right. deliver it. It's expensive, yeah. and with logistics. Yeah, and everything, you know, freight going up 22% recently and meat went up 40%. And, like, it's pretty hard, the industry that we're in, but we're committed to making a change and that's what keeps us going. Were you able to deliver through the pandemic? Yeah. You were? So there was... Whatever in place. Essential so, service. Essential <laughs> service. Yeah. Yeah. If they yeah. can deliver alcohol, surely they can deliver healthy food. <laughs> Come on. The difference was, though, so a lot of companies actually have exited since COVID with big exits because they doubled or tripled their numbers. And they did that uh. because people were online food ordering and, you know, Uber Eats and all of that. But we were telling people to eat themselves better, right? Mm. And people are going, oh, no, I'm going to drink myself to death. I'm yeah. going to eat mm. these Yeah, Daniel's it's all miserable. I'm going to yeah. drink and yeah. eat. Yeah, yeah. So when we say no alcohol, small portions, lots mm. of veggies and salad, they're like, not for me, yeah, not yeah. right now. So it was pretty hard, the pandemic for us, because you can't tell people you've got to focus on their health when they're like, that's the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. Who cares? So now they've eaten themselves to death. We're coming yeah. back. And yeah, we're kind yeah. of going, we can undo this for you. Can you I, fix me, Kate? <laughs> yeah. Sure can. Yeah. I thought it would have been the opposite. Yeah. I thought the pandemic would have helped you out, to be honest, because everyone was ordering the food, not healthy but not stuff. the health yeah. 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 That. Yeah. Which is the time we should have been because yeah. there was no gyms. That's right. Yeah. Which is crazy. We tried that message. And didn't work. Deaf ears. <laughs> not the smartest yeah. people, that's Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Aussies will come around. They'll go, I've got to lose yeah. those COVID kilos. Yeah. Here we go, Kate. I'm on. And the okay. quicker you get it off, the longer your life will be, basically. So it is that's the sense of urgency. And I, I've had some really good conversations with key people in the industry. We're working with the CSIRO, we've got the first endorsement in Australian history. We're working with Deakin oh. University, their food and mood centre. And Professor Felice Jacker did the world's first smile study, which is um an acronym for basically if you eat well, you cure mental health conditions, anxiety and depression. So there's been heaps of research to show even a Mediterranean style diet can reduce depression and anxiety by 30%. So where her current project, she's working on Be Fit Food to look at it for a, a potential cure for mental health conditions. Like how can what you put in your gut yeah, change yeah. your gut bugs to talk to your brain to make you a happier, less anxious person? And, you know, those studies take years. So it'll be, you know, it's supposed to be three years, the pandemic sort of pushed that out to five years. But yeah. They're the things that we care about. So, you know, for us, eventually, we want to be on the Medicare PBS. Before you get your diabetes medication, get your B-Fit food, see how that goes. And if that works for you, you may not need the medication. And if the medication's on top of that, that's okay, but you're going to live longer and you'll need less of it. That's that's incredible. Is there there a bit of political stuff to that as well? Because you've got the pharmaceuticals. Because Dr. Peter Brockner said the same thing. He's trying to stop diabetes in Australia. But the pharmaceutical companies have too much power. Is that something you're finding? Absolutely. But on the flip side of that, um, people are getting smarter as well. So opening their eyes. Because we can share we can share information these days, right? We don't we don't have to be dictated by the big media and stuff. People like Kate can go out with a message. Get on the Little Fish podcast. Yeah. 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 But rattle rattle the make some make some noise. And people, you know, if it's if it's real and the and like you were just saying then you're doing the studies and you're running towards regulation, Mm. like Kate's not hiding. She's standing so, in front of her product and saying, this is the real deal and what yeah. I'm saying is real. But yeah. and we'll prove as well it. by the yeah. CSIRO, is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that message, I was scared to say that out loud because you are scared of people coming at you and I've had them all come at me now. So I was like, come back again. <laughs> yeah. I have all the, the dossier information ready to go. Um, and, and then you get people in your industry, that tall poppy syndrome. So I've had a couple of people have a real personal attack about you're trying to make money out of um, you know commercialising food when people can cook themselves and I was mm. like, cool, I'm not making any money, but um, <laughs> I am trying to help them. Yeah, I'm, I'm shouting them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and you know, they, those sorts of attacks where I was like, you know what, this is much bigger than a food company. This is actually how do we, we're giving free dietitian services. Like I yeah. charge 150 there, it's free here. Yeah, yeah. I'm not hiding that. Like we're not charging because we actually want to change lives and make a difference. And the only way we can do, do that is talk about it. And even that duty of care, like in a pharmacy, why are you presented with supplements? and medications and not food. There has to be a food option. So that's what we're working on at the moment. We're going to be the food option because it's actually not fair to only present one side of the argument. Is it the same around the world? Is it it unique to Australia or is it... 
In America, I haven't done a lot of travel, obviously. No one has recently, <laughs> but uh, apparently, like, their drugstores, pharmacy stores actually sell lots of different food products and whatever else too. So okay. it, it, it's a bit of a different model. But, it, you know, my vision is that if you go to the doctor, your script is for a better diet, yeah. more movement, mm. something for your mental health. Yeah. And the medication is way down the list. Last because it just makes sense. The side mm. effects, like you eat better diet, you sleep better, you feel better, all those sorts of things. You take the medication, eventually you'll take mm. more, you'll get headaches. You'll, the side effects are horrific. I mean, like your liver will fail, you'll kill brain cells, you'll, you will get dementia. Like they... It's in the fine print. Why don't we know? This? But why don't we know this? That's the well. The fine print doesn't actually come in the packet anymore. I found out because my dad got some medication the other day, and I was like, he's like, I've got so many side effects from this, and I was like, where's the, the little printout? There's no printout in the box. So you actually have to scan the QR code, oh, go online, so and read it. It's harder now to get it. And dad's not doing that. No, the old no, QR no. code. What's that? Dad's seventy nine. Well, it's trying to teach old dogs. Yeah. Trying to teach old dogs new tricks yeah. on yeah. scale, you know. Yeah. And wow. Dad's the best cook in the world, by the way. He's <laughs> got like five hundred cookbooks, maybe more. And Sharp knives, outdoor kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. All he does the is sharpest cook. knives in the kitchen. All he watches on TV, yeah. cooking shows. Yeah, yeah Dad's done a lot of the recipes. Actually, he's Dad's Chinese, by the way. So yeah. I'm part Chinese. Yeah. He's half Chinese. So we have the most amazing dim sims, and it's Dad's home oh, recipe. Love a dim sim. Top three. Top three for me. Vegetarian ones, I'd like them. <laughs> That's, uh, Kate, you're doing some amazing things. We really appreciate your time. Really appreciate you coming in and hopefully have you back one day. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I just want to say one thing. Like uh, One thing, one of my goals in my life is to leave a legacy in my industry, the construction industry. You're doing that in your industry. You're changing it. You're changing people's lives. So you're going to leave an amazing legacy and, and hats off to you for that. Absolutely. Thank 100%. You. Well said, Hollywood. Yeah, That's yeah. It's, bigger, it's bigger than just business, isn't it? Like some oh. people are just running businesses. Yeah. This is- Changing lives. Yeah, changing lives. Yeah. This is, it's a mission, yeah. Mm. Do you, one little bit to add there. A girlfriend went for a job at a business and they said to her, a big corporate, they said, um, do you know what the vision for the business is? She goes, I read it on the website, but actually I don't want to work here if that's what it actually is. Profit for shareholders. I was like- Wow. That is not why our business exists. I'm sure they'd like that, yeah. but um, that does not sit in our yeah. values, goals, uh, whatever. Yeah. Like I get it that you need to do that to make the business run, but how could you work for a business that doesn't have a bigger purpose? Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Right, well said. Mm. Well said. Awesome, Kate. Thanks again. That's it, guys. Like, share, subscribe, comment. Tell us how much you loved it. If someone's going to get value out of this pod, please share it with them. Love it, guys. See you at the top. You. I'll be on time next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>